Right, let me, I will introduce Antonio. Well, I'd like to welcome to the stage Antonio Piazza, who's going to present Careful Who You Collab With, Ab Abusing Google Collaboratory. Antonio Piazza, hailing from Cleveland, Ohio, USA, is a purple team leader and offensive security engineer at NVIDIA. Following his stint as a U.S. Army human intelligence collector, you and I should talk after your talk. <laughs> we, uh, he worked as a defense contractor operator on an NSA red team. So he's an intimately familiar with spies, hacking, and nerd stuff. Antonio is a passionate is passionate about all things related to macOS security and hacking. Thus, spends his days researching macOS internals and security, as well as writing free open source red team tools for use in the defense against the dark arts. Oh, that's I, that sounds cool. As of late, he has been planning to implement machine learning into red teaming with his NVIDIA colleagues. So. Please welcome Antonio. Oh, uh, sorry, I have, to give you, uh, I have to give you access, I guess. Uh, let me do that real quick. Hmm. Oh, I see. Sorry. I was looking for your name and not your handle. Uh, there we go. Okay, you have access. All right. So make sure to make sure to pick up a microphone to get megaphone access. Why wouldn't that be good? Yeah. Yeah. Just point your pointer at one of the microphones, and and it'll change from a circle to a funny looking icon, and then left uh, left click it'll pick it up or. Is that right? Left click, right click. No, it's not. Uh... Yeah. I don't know why my my icon's not changing. He has megaphone enabled, so so he's good. Okay. Yeah. You can learn how to. Use these controls, that'd be wonderful. Okay, uh, <clears throat> thanks everyone. I uh, really appreciate you coming and listening to this. Can everyone hear me okay before I start going on? Um, this is my first um, formal doing anything in VR, so hopefully it goes well. I'm uh, gonna be looking at my slides a lot, so um, yell at me if something happens. <clears throat> um, so anyway, um, when I started this research, I was toying around with the idea of creating a startup that would uh, provide a service to artists that would allow them to gain inspiration through AI. That was kind of the premise of the, the startup idea I had. Uh, and I wanted to start with music because um, that's where my passion is. The idea is that a musician or the idea was that, that a musician who needs inspiration for writing their next song uh, could submit some samples of their music. Or, or of songs from which they they wish to emulate or they gain inspiration from, um, and and the AI, the AI uh, would then throw together a bunch of you know riffs similar to uh, but not the same uh, as the style that the the user submitted. Um, I started using Google Collaborator and getting involved in the AI art music community, uh, including um, the DataBots Discord channel. Um, and, and reading white papers concerning sample RNN, um, not having a great GPU on my own computer at the time, um, they were, and they were super expensive and hard to get, um, not anymore thanks to me working at NVIDIA. Um, some AI researchers in the community directed me to, to Google Collaboratory. Um, so I started playing with it and found it to be a great tool for AI collaboration and you get a free GPU, which is really nice. Um, so this research didn't start with anything to do with security. Um, next slide, please. But then um, a researcher in the DataBots Discord um, who was involved in another project called OpenAI Jukebox. Um, this platform allows a user to train the AI by feeding it a, a song or whatever, and whatever um, written lyrics the user wishes. And the AI will give you in return a song where the artist uh, sings the lyrics you provide. So I was playing around and trying to get Elvis 
to sing the lyrics of uh, Sir, Mis- Sir Mix-a-Lot's Baby Got Back and the style of Suspicious Minds. Next, style, uh, next slide, please. And a researcher, Broccoli, from the AI Jukebox Research Project helped me out by tweaking some of the configurations in my Google Cloud file, which he shared with me via this Discord message. Um, I opened, opened the file in Collab as normal, and again, as normal, I began the process of mounting my Google Drive in Collab. And this is when it hit me. Um, when, this, when I mounted my Google Drive, this prompt came up on the screen and it said, I don't know if you can read it, but it says, uh, this notebook is requesting access to your Google Drive files. Your ending access to Google Drive will permit code executed in the notebook to modify files in your Google Drive. Make sure to review notebook code prior to allowing the access. And that's where security research began for this. So next slide, please. And again, the talk is titled, Careful who you collab with of using Google Collaboratory. Next slide, please. And I am Antonio Piazza. I go by Antman1P on the Twitters. I'm an offensive security engineer. Um, most of my security experience is strictly red teaming. Um, I've worked at Zoom, Box, the Cleveland Clinic, on an NSA red team um, as a defense contractor. And now uh, I am the purple team leader in NVIDIA on the threat operations team. And um, that Odin logo down there, some stickers. If you're here at DEF CON, I'm here. I'll be down in the AI village after this talk, and I'll hand them out if you want some. Um, I'm also in my final course of the Master's of Science in Information Security Engineering program at SANS Technology Institute. I'm a father of five, a husband, and again, I love music. Next slide, please. Um, so the agenda here, we're just going to, pretty brief, we're going to discuss what Google Collaboratory is, because I'm sure some of you do, don't know, some of you might be familiar. We're going to talk about how we can abuse Google Collab, and then we're just going to kind of con- conclude. Next slide, please. So what is Google Collaboratory? Um, I'll let Google define it, because I think they best describe it in detail. Collaboratory, or Collab for short. Is a product from Google Research. Collab allows anybody to write and execute arbitrary Python code through the browser and is especially well suited to machine learning, data analysts, and ed- education. More technically, Collab is, host- is a hosted Jupyter Notebook service that requires no setup to use while providing access free of charge to computing resources, including GPUs. Um, Collab resources are not guaranteed and not unlimited, and the usage limits sometimes fluctuate. Um, so you actually, if you're interested in having reliable access and better resources, um, you could purchase Collab Pro, which is, I think, about $50 a month. Um, what is the difference between Jupyter and Collab? Um, Jupyter is an open source project in which Collab is based. Collab allows you to use and share Jupyter Notebooks with others um, without having to download and install or run anything. So that's the example I gave of, uh, you know, um, Broccoli sharing um, a collab file with me. He was actually sharing a, um, a Jupyter Notebook a file. Next slide, please. How is collab normally used? Um, you can write your own notebooks, which are stored in your Google account. Google Drive. Um, basically, you write Python code in a Jupyter Notebook cell, and you execute the cells by uh, pushing the execute button. When you open or start a notebook, you connect it to the, a collab runtime, and that's where you get your GPU and other resources and uh, they start uh, spin up and start running. And you also may connect your notebook to your Google Drive. So in the slide here, the picture, I got arrows uh, from a, a Jupyter cell. And the you can see the little black um, play button, which is how you run a cell. And then on the upper right-hand corner, just showing you your, your resources uh, usage for, for your runtime. Next slide, please. How is uh, Collab normally used? Kind of continuing, um, you can import Python libraries just as no, you could normally do in Python. Um, you can install dependencies with pip, and you can clone Git repos all into these um, uh, Jupyter Notebook cells. Next slide, please. Um, you also 
um, have a collab terminal. So once uh, connected to the collab runtime, uh, you have a terminal that you can use to run shell commands. And once connected to Drive, you can navigate the connected Google Drive file system. Um, uh, question, where is my code executed? What happens to my execution state if I close the browser window? The code is executed in a virtual machine uh, uh, private to your account. Uh, virtual machines are deleted when idle for a while and have a minimum lifetime enforced by the collab service. I, I don't, I haven't sat and tried to figure out what that time is, but that's something I'll probably do in the future. Um, it seems to last a while as long as you're active. Uh, next slide, please. Um, finally, I want to touch on system aliases. So Jupyter has a number of system ali aliases or basically command shortcuts um, to common op operations such as LS, cat, PS, kill, so just your, your normal, you know, Nix um, um, built-in commands. Um, you can execute these from the Jupyter notebook cell by adding the um, bang or the, the exclamation point before the command, so bang LS. Um, we'll run the LS command. Next slide, please. All right, so how is this um, abusable? Well, let's recap. If I'm an adversary and I share a collab file with someone, a Jupyter notebook with someone, if they choose to use my file, they must mount their Google Drive and execute it. So that's key, right? Um, they would be executing the malicious code I sent them. Um, the adversary could potentially access all of the contents of a victim's Google Drive and exfiltrate anything they choose at that point. Um, the adversary can edit the victim's collab files to create backdoors um, that might also exploit other users that the victim uh, collaborates with. Um, can have a reverse shell on a collab a virtual machine in the runtime we're talking about. Um, you know. Is there a possibility to do a VM escape? It's um, maybe. Uh, this, this All this could be as simple as sending a phishing email with a link to a malicious collab file or sending a link to a malicious collab file in an AI community Discord server, just like you know the ones I hang out in and kind of the way that Broccoli shared um, the file with me. Now, I got to say, the one he shared with me was not malicious, by the way. I, I scared him when he saw these slides. He thought, like, oh, my God, did I send you something malicious? I'm like, no, no, no. That just got my brain working like an adversary. So um, uh, you can hide malicious code in Jupyter cells. You can hide it in Git repos, since you can clone Git repos into your Jupyter notebook. So there's a number of, of ways. Um, next slide, please. Um, so for a clear understanding of what an attacker might have access to if they successfully gain access to a victim's collab runtime or their Google Drive, here are the permissions that one grants um, when mounting a Google Drive for a collab session. Um, if you're having a hard time seeing these, I can read them real quick, but it's like see, edit, create, delete all of your Google Drive files, view the photos, videos, albums in your Google Photos. Uh, retrieve mobile client configuration and experimentation. Um, view Google people information, such as profiles and contacts. So basically all the contacts you have in your, you know, your Google account, including your phone or your Gmail. Um, see, edit, create, and delete any of your Google Drive documents. Next slide, please. Um, to see what an, attack, an attacker might do, we can take a look at MITRE ATLAS. Um, so it, uh, ATLAS stands for Adversarial Threat Landscape for Artificial Intelligence Systems. Um, it's a knowledge base of adversary tactics, techniques, and case studies in learning systems um, based on real world observations, demonstrations from machine learning red teams and security groups and the state of poss uh, what's possible from an ac from academic research. Atlas is basically modified after the MITRE attack framework, which people are commonly more familiar with. And it's uh, tactics and techniques are complementary to those in MITRE attacks. So how can atta an attacker do this? Um, well, for initial access, we discussed phishing the AI community or ML research community via email or Discord servers. 
MITRE ATLAS has a uh, machine learning supply chain compromise technique under the initial access tactic that might make sense. So maybe um, we can add a sub technique there for Jupyter notebook sharing. Um, also uh, user execution under the execution um, tactic. So an attacker might hide a backdoor in a Jupyter cell or maybe hide a backdoor in a Git repo uh, that the notebook clones. Next slide, please. Um, this is an example here of hiding malicious code in Jupyter notebook cells. Um, here is code that the, on the left that will give an adversary access to the victim's Google Drive. While an adversary shared um, this notebook, a victim might easily recognize that this is not AI ML. Just this, this one on the left is just all, you know, for getting uh, for an adversary getting access to Google Drive. But some of the AI and ML notebooks are quite large, as you can see on the right. That's not even the whole thing. And I zoomed out as far as possible to take that screenshot. Um, an adversary might be able to hide the malicious bits um, within normal, um, you know, machine learning code. So the image on the right is just one small piece um, from a collab project with an AI community member uh, that an AI community member shared with me. Um, and nothing malicious in there, just an example of how much code there is that you, um, you know, an adversary could hide malicious um, cells and or malicious code in. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, this is the example of the malicious code by the numbers, right? Uh, so imagine you receive a link from or to a collab file and you open it. If you run all of this, you, uh, you will give the sender access to all your files in your Google Drive via NGROC. Um, so the first thing you do in the code is or the victim is going to mount their Google Drive. And again, this is normal behavior for all collab files, right? Like in order to, to kind of persist and store, um, you know, the data created from running one of these, um, you have to store it somewhere in, in your, in, and when you're in the cloud, you're going to mount you're going to store it. Um, the next step, you're going to wget ngrok tarball and untar it. Uh, the third step is you're going to uh, you register your attacker ngrok API key. Um, so it's a bit dangerous um, for an attacker to, I guess, hard code an API key, but um, an attacker can always change change it when they're done pillaging or if they're unsuccessful with the attack. Uh, so it's not too bad. Um, step four is start a Python server on a specified port. So like 9999 in this case, and then um, and then run ngrok on the on the same port in step five. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is a video demo. Um, I don't know were you able to be able to uh, run the videos from from this presentation? I don't know if that problem was solved or I don't know if anybody can hear me. Should be running right now. Oh, oh, it's running. Okay, I can't see it, but I'll just go ahead. So, um, the victim uh, again will run run the collab file mount their drive so you can see, uh, but off screen, I'm picking up or picking my Gmail account and allowing the drive access as I showed uh, in the image earlier. And now I could navigate the file system on the left, on the left if I wanted. Um, so installing Python requests, um, don't really need it here, but I, if I want to show how you can use pip if needed, um, I do a PWD to show the content or the correct location of the Google Drive file system. And then I curl ifconfig.me to show my cloud VM IP address. wget to download ngrok, tar to untar ngrok, run ngrok, uh, config to add my API key, run, run the Python server to serve the um, Google Drive root directory, run ngrok, and then on the attacker side, um, the attacker goes to uh, to the ngrok agents. Is there a way to like tilt my my view so I can look up and see the slides? I'm like looking down. 
Yes, move your mouth forward. Oh, there it is. Okay. Oh, did something go wrong? Or... Oh, no. No, okay. it's video. Do you need me to rewind it any bit or no? No, no, you're okay. I think I'll just kind of. So on the attacker side, the, the attacker goes to uh, Ngarok agents. Um, and you might have saw there the IP address of the agent matched um, what I got from the um, the uh, curling of I, I can say got me. And then we're in, so um, we can navigate the, the Google Drive system and download whatever we want from the victim. Um, so that what you're seeing there is kind of like a you know upper browser in browser representation of the the victim's um, Google Drive. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so that was the example of being able to get into a victim's Google Drive, and this one is a reverse shell example. Um, it's really it's two simple steps in, um, for this one. So basically mount the uh, victim Google Drive and then do a bash TCP reverse shell um, to the adversary C2 server IP address. And I, I didn't show um, a video for this because it's just so simple, um, but you get the idea it's, uh, of what a, a reverse shell is going to look like. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so knowing all this, you know, what is the problem? So, quickly, GPUs are a little harder to find um, due to supply chain issues. They're more, they're pretty expensive. Um, where Collab is free and um, and even Pro is cheap. Um, AI and ML researchers are starting to use Collab more, especially um, education sectors and universities. Um, or using something similar like these cloud-based uh, Jupyter Notebook um, runtime environments. Um, and researchers are collaborating and sharing, right? This is a pretty exciting time where we're, we're able to, you know, someone like me who's not super schooled in AI and ML can get their start because there's just so many cool, you know, so much cool research going on there. People are willing to share it and you get to learn how to do all the crazy cool AI stuff. Um, where I think the problem comes in is that most AI and ML researchers uh, and developers are not security experts, right? So um, it's kind of like at the beginning of software engineering, like nobody's really thinking about security. Um, it took a while for that to change and we're kind of back like at square one with that, I think with uh, AI and ML researchers. Um, the good news is security has been you know around for a while and we kind of saw the mistakes from uh, that were being made at the beginning uh, you know uh, with software engineering so hopefully we can um quickly jump in and start you know um securing things in the uh, machine learning and ai uh, sector so and um finally fishing is easy right like um been on a lot of red teams and you know it's a numbers game if i send out hundred fish, I'm, I, I know I'm going to get at least one, um, as long as they all make it through, you know, your email filtering. That's never really been a problem. So, um, and it's scary. Um, what, how can we fix it? Um, well, ML researchers and, and people who are collaborating should read the code someone shares with them. Um, let that Google Drive mount warning remind you every time, like, oh, before I mount this, let me look through and make sure this code is um, it's good and it's what I was expecting and nothing weird in there. And I know that's difficult um, because, again, in that example, code that could be in one of these, um, you know, notebooks, it, it, it might be difficult to find those needle in the haystack, and especially if the researcher doesn't know what to look for. So, um, you know, that's one thing I think as security experts, we should probably start doing is educating um, machine learning and AI researchers in what bad looks like, right? So this is me, um, hopefully getting something out, you know, to the security community, and hopefully this will spread from the security community into the ML research and AI community and um, start using your expertise to, to educate uh, 
those folks on on what bad looks like. So then they they can search for that in their in their notebooks. Um, develop maybe develop a code sharing plugin, you know, in Google Drive. Um, maybe Google can do that, or the open source community can do that. Next slide, please. With that, um, thanks again. Uh, this is really cool doing something for the first time in VR. Hopefully, it uh, went smoothly for everyone else. Um, and again, I hope I hope uh, you got something out of this. Um, and please feel free to ask any questions. I know I'm probably out of time here, but hopefully, I can answer some questions. Basically, to um, kind of watch themselves to make sure they don't download any malicious code. <laughs> you know, um, it's funny because I've I've heard that question before. Um, basically, is is this is this a problem that the users need to solve? Um, well, absolutely. But you know, if you think about it, it's a you know security education has been trying to push a, push the responsibility on the user, which ultimately. It is in the in the end, but like is that working, you know, like our users listening and, and and especially if you're you're you know securing a enterprise or um you know a corporate network or something like we would hope all the users would do due diligence, but it just never turns out that way, right? Like um I would love if every person would be super diligent when opening a, an email and not clicking on a, a link, right? But it just never happens. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think there's always a end user responsibility, but um, ultimately I think, you know, we have to do our part as well as, um, you know, security experts. Um, should Google do anything? Um, my opinion, they should have more than just that warning. Um, but, you know, I've, I've submitted several things to Google. I, I don't know. I, I don't try to pick on Google, but I use Google a lot. So I end up finding things. Um, I've submitted things and, you know, they're just like, oh, that works as normal. And I'm like, that doesn't seem like great security practice, but um, no, that's the response. So I, I don't have an expectation that Google will do anything. Um, I, I wish they would, but, um, you know, I think ultimately we're going to have to rely <clears throat> on the open source uh, community to we develop some plugins or, or again, help um, educate people. Um, next slide, please. I actually have one more slide. Sometimes I get, it's not really a question, but people want to hear the, the maybe got back thing with Elvis. Um, <laughs> I can play it if you want to. Hopefully we can play <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't know if that went as smoothly as I hope, but <laughs> uh, it, it's a work in progress. But it, it gets pretty crazy um, when when the end the the AI starts um, singing in some alien language. Uh, it reminds me of this show. Um, devs when the the uh like they had the background weird noise of the uh, quantum computer speaking it's kind of spooky but anyway uh any other questions all right well thanks a lot again i really appreciate it thank you antonio for your presentation uh have to be careful, I guess, who we collab with from here on out. I, I never thought of that Jupyter Notebooks being used in that way. That's quite clever. <laughs>